Grace and peace to you from the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Marvin Lindsay, and on behalf of our ministry staff and elders and deacons, I'd like to welcome you to this online worship service at First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, Missouri. Let us now join our hearts and voices in praise to the living God as we sing songs to, of praise. Hallelujah, 
before we know we will say hallelujah for we know the God of hope And now our Director of Children's and Youth Ministry, Audra West, has a word for children who are watching the worship service this morning about the scripture passage that we're going to hear in just a few moments. Good morning, it's me, Audra, and it's great to see you this morning. Is this a phrase that you use and hear often? God loves it when we say thank you. And in today's scripture lesson found in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, Jesus performs a miracle. There were 10 men who had a disease called leprosy. With leprosy, your skin is, well, yucky, and sometimes it made your, some of your body parts fall off. These 10 men came to Jesus and asked him for healing. He told them to go to the priest in the church and to show themselves to them. As the men went along down the road, they realized they had been healed. And do you realize how many of them came back to say thank you? One. Only one man came back to tell Jesus thank you. Now, he was happy that that one man came back to tell him thank you, but probably a little sad the others didn't. Now, Jesus is merciful, so he didn't put leprosy back into the men's bodies or punish them in any way. And, of course, he was very hopeful and happy that the one man did come back. I know that we think we would do the right thing if we had been healed, but how often do we forget to say thank you? God gives us opportunities and things every day. Every breath we take Everything we have and our lives come from Him. We should say thank you all of the time, every day, but sometimes we all forget. The Bible tells us to give thanks and to pray always. Not only should we give thanks to God for our health, but also for the others He places around us. God gives us friends and family to help us. Let's take a minute right now to tell God thank you. So pray with me. Dear God, thank you for all of your blessings. Thank you for the words of the Bible. Help us to remember that every good thing comes from you and to bless one another. Thank you for your love. We love you, God. Amen. So remember, say please and thank you. See ya. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. That as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. It happened that as he made his way toward Jerusalem, he crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men, all lepers, met him. They kept their distance, but raised their voices, calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Taking a good look at them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. They went, and while still on their way, became clean. One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet, so grateful. He couldn't thank him enough and he was a Samaritan. Jesus said, Were not ten healed? Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider? Then he said to him, Get up, on your way. Your faith has healed and saved you. Here ends the reading of God's holy scripture. Now, some passages of scripture are pretty uh, hard to interpret. 
But not this passage of Scripture. I mean, if uh, I asked you what the moral of the story was, well, I'll just ask the musicians gathered here today, what do you think the moral of the story is here? Give, uh, give thanks? Yeah, I'll always say thank you. It's like, it's uh, something that my mother-in-law tells me. It's always polite to send a thank you, Nate. I'll always give thanks. So I, so I suppose that I could just end the sermon right here and we can move on to the next element of the worship service and get on to the rest of our weekend a little bit earlier. But I think if I did that, I would be shortchanging you. I know I'm aware of the fact that more ministers are criticized for sermons that go too long than sermons that go too short, but I really think I need to at least say a few more things about this passage of Scripture. And I think the more than, or the extra thing that needs to be said, we can find in continuing to compare and contrast this one man who was healed of his leprosy with the nine others who went on their way. Uh, All ten were healed, but one experienced salvation. Jesus says at the very end of the passage, get up on your way, your faith has healed and saved you. So all ten had healing, but one experienced salvation. So what is the saving faith that distinguishes the one who returned from the nine who went on their way? Well, if you read the passage of Scripture, this one who returned, this Samaritan, a a foreigner, uh, he is the subject of four different verbs. Uh, It says that he returned, it says that he praised God, or in this translation, he, he was shouting loudly uh, uh, shouts of gratitude and glorifying God. He kneeled before Jesus and he thanked him. And I think that a deeper and fuller portrait of saving faith will emerge as we look a little more deeply at these four verbs. So just uh, listen to me for a minute and walk with me for a minute as I walk us through these four verbs. The first thing that the Samaritan does is that he returns. He turns back to say thanks to Jesus. Now, uh, the Old Testament scriptures required that anybody who was cured of the disease of leprosy or any other skin disease had to go to the sanctuary and present themselves before the priest, and the priest would certify that they were healed, and then they would present an offering of gratitude to God. Uh, So the Scriptures commanded this, and Jesus reinforces the command when he says, go show yourself to the priest. But the Samaritan returns. He delays his trip to the temple to return and to give thanks to Jesus. One uh, pastor who writes a commentary on Scripture uh, said in his online commentary, he noted the irony that the Samaritan had to disobey Jesus in order to give him the gratitude and thanks that Jesus deserved. So it seems as though saving faith means that at times we can set aside the requirements of religion if setting aside those requirements enables us to come face to face with Jesus Christ and say thanks to him and offer him our gratitude. The second thing uh, about saving faith is that it manifests itself in praise, in shouts of gratitude, in glorifying God. You know, um, all uh, human beings experience some wonderful things uh, in the course of their lives. You know, we experience from time to time uh, the taste of a good cup of coffee, or we experience a, a grandchild snuggling up next to us and asking us to read a book, or we experience the beauty of a sunset, or we experience healing like the man does in this morning's scripture passage. But what distinguishes saving faith is that we don't just enjoy those things in and of themselves, but we give glory to God for giving those things to us. Saving faith is the recognition that behind the beautiful sunset is a God who gave us eyes to see. And behind uh, the snuggles of little grandkids are the go- is the God who gave us arms to enfold our loved ones. And behind the good cup of coffee in the morning is the God who gave us taste buds to experience such wonders. Saving faith doesn't just enjoy good things in and of themselves, but enjoys them in God, refers them to God, and glorifies God for them, whether they're great or whether they're small. The third thing the Samaritan does is he kneels. He gets on his knees before Jesus, 
And in this posture of kneeling, he acknowledges that Jesus is his Lord and Savior. His master is the word that's used in the scripture passage. Saving faith acknowledges that there is one who is greater than we are. And this one has the power to heal us of our diseases, to forgive us of our sins, and to bring order to our chaotic lives. And finally, the Samaritan thanks Jesus. Couldn't thank him enough, uh, in the words of this morning's translation. Saving faith joins hearts bursting with generosity to jaws that are flapping and mouths that are motoring and issuing forth a torrent of words that express our gratitude and our thanksgiving for what God in Jesus Christ has done for us. Saving faith is an act of faith. It's a faith that gives back to Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes when Christians talk about saving faith, we talk about it in terms of something that we have that other people don't have, or something that's been given to us that other people don't enjoy. But in light of the Samaritan saving faith, I think that saving faith is not so much something that we have as something that we give back to Jesus Christ that maybe other people don't give back. We give to Jesus Christ our time. We give to Jesus Christ glory. We give to Jesus Christ humble, reverent submission. And we give to Jesus Christ our heartfelt thanksgiving. Saving faith isn't about what we have that others don't. It's about what we give back to Jesus that so many people neglect to give back to him. So now I want to uh, turn at this point in the sermon to where we are in our life as a congregation together and maybe reflect on that in light of the scripture passage that we've heard this morning. And then I'm going to ask you to do one of four things which I think will deepen your experience of saving faith and deepen your response to Christ and, to, and, and make your service to Christ's church richer and more fulfilling. Uh, it's autumn, and uh, we're recording this worship service uh, on a beautiful, uh, kind of warmish autumn afternoon. Uh, I read uh, somewhere on my phone that it's going to get cool, and it may be warm up a little bit, uh, but you can see the... the uh, leaves turning and you can feel the chill in the air in the morning. And for members of First Presbyterian Church, autumn brings stewardship season, uh, that time of the year when we think about what God has given us and how we can take care of it. And if you have been a member of the church for some time, you may be thinking of stewardship season as, well, it's that time when uh, the session asks us to make a pledge to the operating budget so that we can pay our bills. And there's something, certainly something to that. But there's more to it than that. Uh, stewardship flows from saving faith. What we give to the church monetarily and financially is rooted in what we give to Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. What we give to Christ in terms of time, in terms of glory and praise, in terms of humble, reverent submission and thanksgiving. So uh, in this uh, second week of our generosity challenge uh, and in this uh, time of stewardship, I'm not going to ask you, at least at this moment, to make a monetary gift to the church. Uh, you are going to get some uh, information in the mail later on this month, and I'm going to make an ask in there. But for the time being, I'm not going to ask you to give any money. But I am going to ask you to do something that will deepen your experience of saving faith. And I'm going to ask you to do that because that's the prerequisite to, uh, to generosity with our financial gifts. Uh, if you do one of these four things, I think that you'll have a richer and deeper experience of your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that will make your gift to the church, whatever the dollar figure is, more impactful and richer and more fulfilling for the mission and ministry of the church. Uh, so one of the four things has to do with these four things that the Samaritan does. First thing is this, and it's rooted in the Samaritans turning back from the sanctuary to encounter Jesus and give him thanks face to face. I know that for a lot of you, the inability to be here on Sunday mornings is a source of pain and grief, and there's a sense of deep loss as we're in six months now 
of not being able to worship in person. But I want to ask you, if you're feeling that experience of grief and loss, to look at this in terms of a problems as opportunities perspective. And look at it in terms of uh, what the Samaritan did when he was detoured from going to the sanctuary out of his deep need to encounter Jesus face to face. Perhaps this pandemic is an opportunity for us to step away from the sanctuary for a period of time so that we can encounter Jesus Christ in other places, in other venues, in other ways, and in ways where we are able to express our gratitude and thanksgiving in a deeper way than we have been able to before. If that is the case, then when we come back together, our experience of God and one another in this sanctuary will also be deeper and more fulfilling. Second possibility for you to do is this. If you run in circles with people who are not Christians, then I want to invite you to let them hear your voice of gratitude and joy for what God has done for you. Like I said earlier, all people can experience uh, the good things in life and experience and feel awe and pleasure um, and joy about them. But what is different about the Christian experience is that behind the good cup of coffee or the grandchild snuggling up next to us or the beautiful sunset or the words from the surgeon that the operation was a success, behind all of these things is a good and loving God who wants to bless us and wants to transform us. And encountering that one makes the experience of the good things in life so much more fulfilling. So let your friends and family members and co-workers who are not yet on the path of discipleship hear about that from you so that they too can experience it. Saving faith is not just uh, fire insurance for the next life. Saving faith adds a dimension um, to our experiences of joy and awe and good feeling in this life. It makes those experiences so much richer because we know the one from whom they ultimately derive. Third thing is this. If you're a praying person, get on your knees when you pray. Literally, get on your knees when you pray. If you're physically able to, I want to invite you to get on your knees when you pray. You know, the human body speaks its own language. And so when our bodies are speaking the language of humility and reverence and submission, then our hearts and minds will be touched and transformed by that. We may well find ourselves thinking more highly of other people than we do. We may well find ourselves giving God the glory more than we did otherwise. And we may come to a more realistic understanding of who we are as sinners in need of God's grace than when we did before we got on our knees. A final option is this. Give thanks. Think this week about three or four people who have influenced your life for the good and sit down and write them a thank you note and put it in the mail so that they can know that they were like a little Christ for you, an instrument of God's love and wisdom and healing and mercy. So let me repeat um, I want to invite you in this stewardship season, challenge you in this stewardship season to do one of four things. To uh, reach out to someone who has been an influence on you and say thanks. To get on your knees when you pray and see what happens. To let others who have not yet set out on the journey of discipleship overhear your words of joy and gratitude, and praise to the one from whom all blessings flow. And what was the fourth one? Oh yes, uh, to use this time of pandemic, this time when we have been turned aside from our regular trips to the sanctuary, to look for Jesus Christ in new places and in new situations, and possibly experience his grace and give him the glory in a deeper and more fulfilling way. As I conclude the sermon, 
just imagine with me for a moment if uh, we did all of these things. Imagine with me for a moment if we use this pandemic time as an opportunity to encounter Jesus Christ in a way that we hadn't before. What would happen when we returned together? What if all of us who are Christians, in fact, all of us throughout the world, would just take the time to say thank you a little more often? What kind of world would we live in if we all expressed gratitude just a few more times than we normally do? What if people who are not Christians heard more joy and praise and gratitude coming out of the mouths of Christians than words of scolding and judgment uh, and fearfulness. What kind of impact would that make for Christ's mission in the world? What if we humbled ourselves before God? What if we got on our knees, both in our bodies and in our spirits, and acknowledged that there is one greater than we are? What if 10 out of 10 Christians came down with a full-blown case of saving faith in Jesus Christ? Imagine the difference that would make for our lives, for the church, and for the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Special music for today is a song that I wrote um, simply entitled, O Lord, Help Me. Uh, it's a prayer um, set to song. Um, and as we just heard, the invitation and even the challenge to make changes in our own lives so that our faith can be a saving faith, often it involves us getting out of our own way. And so I appreciated the words of the sermon this morning, um, the invitation and the challenge that was offered. And um, I know the first step for me is... Um, to take on things like that, the first step for me is to get on my knees and to pray, oh Lord, help me. And that's exactly what this song is. Um, so I pray that this would be a blessing and a ministry uh, to you. When I live like a beast, choose what resists the least. When I'm slave to my sin, let hopelessness win. When my knees just won't bend, when I forget how to pray, when I name myself. My biggest mistake Oh Lord, help me Please, please, please help me When you whisper to me Even when you shout When I just can't here over my persistent doubt when the noise of this world puts me to the sing your lullaby of grace come and give me rest oh lord help me comes from the Lord with my eyes lifted up to the hill their majesty surrounded by your glory reminds me my help comes from the Lord when I 
take that running leap up into the air no net down below me just a tapestry of prayers when I don't know just where I go on the land just help me to try that I'm safe in your hands. Oh, Lord, help me. Please, please, please help me. Please, please, please help me. The Samaritan leper began his conversation with Jesus saying, help me, please help me. And he concluded his conversation by thanking Jesus for the gift of healing and for the gift of saving faith. So now I invite you to join with us in words and songs of thanksgiving to God. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. For you, Creator God, the valleys laugh and sing, and the trees of the field clap their hands. For you, God of all, the church in its myriad forms and countless languages honors its Savior. Millions upon millions invite us to be one with them in the drama of worship. In heaven, beyond our seeing, the angels and saints are caught up in song, and those we have loved and lost are part of that great company. So gladly we join our voices to those of earth, sky, and sea in the universal hymn of praise, which echoes through time and eternity. Lord of power and might, heaven and earth, Full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent your only begotten, in whom your fullness dwells, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. Revealing your love, Jesus taught those who would hear him, healed those who believed in him, received all who sought him, and lifted the burden of their sin. We glorify you for your great power and love at work in Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new people by water and spirit. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come now, O Christ, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, forever bound to us in promise and mystery. Breathe your Spirit upon us and on these gifts from field and from vine. 
Let them become for us the sign and seal of your love, healing, redeeming, making us whole. And through them, let us together become for you your body, loving the world as God loves, serving its people as God wills, and always being transformed until we and all humanity resemble the one who feeds us with his very self. Amen, amen, amen. And now with the boldness of children of God, let us pray the prayer our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Angels said it to frightened shepherds. Jesus said it to dismayed disciples. And now these words which come from heaven are given to reconcile us to God and to each other. Peace be with you and also with you. If you are viewing the service this morning in the company of others, I invite you to share tokens and signs of peace with them at this time. Sisters and brothers, the Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we will conclude this worship service in the same manner that the Samaritan concluded our scripture passage with songs of thanksgiving. Let us unite our hearts and voices together as we sing the hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, which is number 643 in the Glory to God hymnal. Blessed 
peace to cheer us and keep us in God's grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills in this world and the next. All praise and thanks to God who reigns in highest heaven. To Father Son and Spirit now be given, the one eternal God, whom heaven and earth adore, the God who was and is and shall be evermore. Again, sisters and brothers, we thank you for worshiping with us online this Sunday morning. If this worship service was inspirational to you, we invite you to share it with your friends and followers on your social media networks. And now, as we go from this time and space, let us go with words of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.